Today we're going to be talking about a theme that is going to be really relevant for the newer players out there, and I'll be sharing some of the common mistakes that I've seen my students make in the area of calculation. So the main one that I see is that newer players are really reluctant to even consider moves where they give up material. So even if it's like a very promising sacrifice um, and it fits the rules of looking for checks, captures, and threats in order to find it, um, people are just so resistant to even opening their minds to the fact that this kind of move could work. So for example, uh, what we have in front of us, I've given this position to some of my students. I've seen moves like rook here, protecting the rook, you know, the rook trade, um, even the idea of knight f7 with the idea of like a subsequent fork on d6, which doesn't really work, but obviously it shows some kind of tactical vision on the part of white. Um, however, of course, we have to start off by looking at a move like that. So why are people so resistant to this concept? Um, I feel like it's because newer players have just recently learned how not to lose their pieces when they play chess, right? And suddenly you have to make this transition that in order to find the best moves, you actually have to consider losing your pieces. So that's probably where this, this difficulty comes from. Um, but I would say, you know, besides the fact that you got to look at all checks, captures, and threats, you also got to look at all moves that open the opponent's king. So if a move fits that bill, it absolutely has to be considered as a candidate move. So rook takes g7 is not just giving up a rook for a pawn. It is opening the king, and it's leading into a check by the queen, which if you look at it and you realize there's no block, it actually looks very dangerous because you're going to win the knight no matter where the king goes. And basically we get to this position where you should feel like it's very promising. You've opened up your opponent's king. Um, you've only sacrificed a small amount of material for it. It's basically rook for knight. And now you just have to find the crowning blow. You're not going to be able to do it with just your queen and knight. So you got to look at the board and see if you've got other pieces that can help. And indeed, you've got a rook that can come into the game. And this type of rook lift is a very common way to finish off an attack when the king's cover has been taken away. And it's also really helpful that this check is not saving black because the king has a nice ready escape. So the three pieces that white has on the attack is plenty to win the game. There's just no defense to rook g3. And yeah, black's queen and two rooks are not going to be uh, able to help out the king in this position. So it's really a, not a difficult example, guys. Um, but you just have to be open-minded to the fact that a good move could involve the sacrifice of material. Now we're going to look at something a little bit more complicated. And this was a game between two grandmasters that I was analyzing. And just it, this is really the uh, product of my imagination, <laughs> not something that happens in the game. But basically, Black's rook is under attack. The safe move would be something like rook d8. Maybe you can throw an intermediate move like d3 first. But let's say black doesn't have too much of a sense of danger and decides to grab a pawn. The nice part about that move is it also loosens the protection over the knight, so it seems like a good idea, except that white has a very dangerous rook invasion on the back rank. And so this is the position that we're interested in examining. You could pause the video here and try to figure out what black should do. But meanwhile, I'll try to walk you through the thinking process. So how do we navigate really complicated tactical positions like this? There's a lot of elements here, right? There's a rook on the back rank. There's a dangerous pawn on the sixth rank. There's a queen that could come in somewhere, a knight that could maybe come in. So the first place that I would start with is just make sure, do I have checks here as black? Do I have this check? No, I don't because of the pawn. Do I have that check? No, because of the knight. Okay, so I don't have checks, even though white's king is kind of open. We definitely should be aware how safe our opponent's king is, and our king as well. Captures. Well, there is a knight here that I would love to take, and that's really going to be the big question for me. Can I take that guy? Because if I figure out that I can't, I'm going to be unearthing 
some major white ideas in this position. Now here, white has checks like this. So we're gonna start with those moves. Um, well, you can go there, I'll take, there's not really anything too dangerous. I mean, you can win the bishop back, but that doesn't seem like a big problem for black. But this move actually is a big problem for black. The other check. Again, we're looking at it because we're training ourselves to look at all checks and captures, no matter how resistant we are to the idea of giving up material. And then uh, white is going to promote the H pawn because there is no rook H5 because the queen controls that square. So it's a nice little tactic based on pawn promotion. Um, if the queen goes here, you got to find some safe way to get out of check, obviously. So that would be the move E4. And then white will be winning this position. Okay, so we figured out that actually rook takes f8 is a really big idea for white. And what else are ideas for white? Well, like we said h7 is an idea, kind of a deflection trying to win the bishop. There's the queen coming in trying to checkmate on g7. And there's also pawn takes g7, just opening the king and then coming in with the queen. So we're actually facing a really wide variety of threats here. Um, it is important that the knight can't come to attack the bishop because then we have queen d5 picking up the knight. But for example, like some students would think, like queen b4, let's protect the bishop if he's so important, right? But we already know that knight d7 is an idea and then you're not gonna have queen d5 check anymore if you're on b4, so that doesn't work. So basically, the queen can't move. The rook isn't really able to help out. The bishop is pinned. Um, you could try to run with your king, but they're just gonna take your bishop anyway. And then you're gonna wind up in some situation like that where you basically have no defenders around your king. And this is a really big threat as well as the checkmate. So the combination of those things means that black is gonna lose. So we understand our opponent's ideas. We realize that most of our pieces can't help us. And so we kind of, through the process of elim elimination, realize, well, maybe it's some kind of a pawn move, right? Like this one. That helps us in a lot of different ways. It gets rid of that capture. It gets rid of the threat of the queen coming in with a checkmate. And let's say they sack the rook. Well, that actually provides us with our defense to their main idea because now the king can come back to stop the pawn and black actually wins. Very important that the king has that empty square. So they could try something like h7, but then you just take the pawn. If they take your bishop, you have to make a choice. Take the knight or do something else first. And fortunately, we can just make an intermediate move that attacks their rook and protects that pawn in f7. And then we can pick up the knight later with a perfectly nice position. So through this sort of systematic process of understanding our opponent's threats, the whole range of them, and um, kind of realizing that like a lot of our options don't work, we finally land on this quiet pawn move as our main solution for staying alive in this position. So it's really not the kind of move that you should uh, immediately think of, I, because I think there's just other things that we need to check before we get there. And that's kind of where like being systematic um, is gonna be helpful. And of course, a lot of decision-making in chess goes through this elimination process, right? Where you just like weed out all the bad moves um, but that takes a little bit of time. So I think those are the things that I would focus on if, uh, if I were you guys, being open-minded at considering moves that lose material, provided their checks, captures, and threats, and they weaken the opponent's king. That's like at least a minimal start, right? Um, if, you, you know, if you start with that, you'll definitely come up with some decent uh, ideas. And also, when you're facing these complicated positions, try to be as aware of, as possible of the full range of what your opponent wants. Because then you'll realize like why certain solutions are just problematic and they don't work.
And eventually you can eliminate it down to something that can save you. So that's a start, guys. It's not obviously an exhaustive list of, you know, how to calculate better, but, you know, just kind of addressing some of the common mistakes that I see. And um, yeah, well, that's what I wanted to cover for today. And um, now we can chat a little bit about the leather jackets that I was wearing in the previous videos that you guys commented on. So I was thinking we can have a little deal. Every 10,000 subscribers that I get, I'll buy myself a new leather jacket. So we can just work as a team on this, guys. Uh, you watch chess videos and try to get better at chess. And I will work on the leather jacket collection. And um, hopefully we can be successful in that. 